Hello, everyone. Welcome to another webinar from Western Pennsylvania Conservancy. I'm James Carr, I'm the Digital Content Specialist here at WPC. And today we're going to be discussing youth education at WPC in Falling Water. For those of you who are unfamiliar with our work, uh, the Western Pennsylvania takes an active role in protecting and restoring forests, watersheds, and other natural areas across the region. Uh, we also protect wildlife and their habitats, and we work in towns and cities to promote sustainability and improve quality of life for residents through community partnerships. Today, we're focusing on youth programs, but WPC education has been an important part of everything we do for the past 90 years. We try to incorporate an educational component into all of our programs. Uh, if you've attended one of our many volunteer events, uh, garden plantings, tree plantings, or land stewardship events, you've likely learned from a WPC staff member what you're doing, how you're helping, and why it's important. At Falling Water, our educators guide visitors on a path of discovery as they learn about Frank Lloyd Wright, the Kaufman family, architecture, and the concept of living in harmony with nature. Um, to facilitate today's discussion, we have two of our top WPC education experts. Uh, first, we'll have Danielle Freschetti, who has been the education coordinator at WPC since 2018. Much of Danielle's time is spent developing partnerships that aim to engage youth in nature. Um, secondly, we have Falling Water, where she works on education programs for students of all ages. Um, before we get started with Danielle, please note that we will have time to answer some questions at the end of the presentation. So please use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen to submit your questions at any point. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, Danielle in just a moment. Hi, thanks, James. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us for the webinar. Um, as James mentioned, um, the Conservancy has a long, rich history of making educational connections to our work. Um, but when I joined the organization in 2018, we're making a very intentional uh, process of thinking about how do we align um, the wonderful work we do with gains in education around encouraging young people to be conservationists. Um, and so um, some of the ways that we do that is by bringing them into nature, um, allowing them to uh, connect with um, the projects and the land that we steward, um, gardens, the green spaces. Um, so just the value of being in nature. Um, we also want to help them um, understand concepts in nature. Um, and so how do our staff and their expertise um, help not only youth, but also the educators that are working with youth feel really confident in the content um, and the knowledge about how our natural uh, world works. And then also learning for nature. So how um, does all of this help us become better conservationists, better stewards of, uh, of our natural heritage? Um, so you'll see some of those themes throughout the presentation. And this is uh, some of our land and conservation science staff with some students up at Katz Natural Area in Crawford County. Um, so just a couple of uh, kind of foundational um, theories that guide some of our work here. And one is this idea uh, that place matters. Um, so uh, this, I love this quote by Bill Bigelow, who's known as a um, education reform person. And this idea that, you know, place matters, um, place helps us um, think about what we're learning and apply it to our lived experiences um, and how kind of love of place and connection with place can instill a sense of biophilia, kind of um, connection and understanding that we are a part of nature as well. And that nature is all around us. It's not just at a place that we go to, but it really is all around us. And this is a student at um, Crescent Early Childhood Center, which is part of the Pittsburgh Public Schools Early Childhood Programming um, at a school ground green space 
that uh, the Conservancy um, designed and implemented with uh, the teachers there. And um, I think just is giving those students a great place, uh, a great opportunity um, to connect with the nature that's right outside their classroom on a regular basis. We also really think about experiences as great fodder for learning um, and hands-on learning. And so these are just a couple of um, concepts, I think, that we try to uh, connect to in the way that we um, work with other uh, educational organizations. Um, and it's, again, this idea that um, we want to apply these concepts that kids are learning um, to real world scenarios and our projects and the work that we do are these real world scenarios that are just great and rich for learning. Um, and it's also that we know in the learning sciences that knowledge, just pure knowledge, doesn't change behaviors, doesn't um, create pro-environmental behaviors. And so we also need to make sure we're connecting to lived experiences and shared values. Um, this is an example of a project that our watershed staff worked with Joe Walker Elementary, and it was a stream restoration project. And so the students got information, they were able to apply it to their school campus, um, make recommendations. Um, and so really the potential to turn that knowledge into kind of a local action. And for a lot of students, especially when we're working with schools, the school campus is just a great place for them to try out that action. And those actions can help them build a sense of efficacy, right? So um, if we don't think the actions we take make a difference, then we might not take them. And so this sense of self-efficacy that if I do a thing, um, if I work to restore, um, the school campus that I'm on and make the water shed there healthier, it'll make a difference. Um, and so that practice and that real world action can um, build their sense of self-efficacy around these pro-social or pro-environmental behaviors. Um, and then, as I mentioned, we, we took this kind of strategic look at how do we um, kind of strengthen conservation education in our region. And in 2017, uh, the organization held a focus group and invited environmental educators and STEAM educators, so science, technology, engineering, arts, and math educators from the region um, to kind of advise us on, you know, what, where, where can we plug in? Where can we be a value add and not a duplicative effort? How do we really think about conserving our resources around um, strengthening conservation education? And so um, we came to this understanding of that the strengths that our organization can bring to conservation education are the lands that we steward, um, are the projects that we work on, the greening, um, the natural heritage projects, the knowledge that um, our, our staff are creating and applying. Um, and so that's where we focus. So all of our work is really focused on partnering with existing environmental education or um, school-based education, out-of-school time programs um, that connect to um, learning outcomes that, uh, that we can help with, right? That we can bring our work to. So it's youth focused. We work with formal and non-formal uh, educational organizations, kind of pre-K through 16. We also um, really work to acknowledge the inequalities and in access to environmental education and really great STEAM education. Um, and so we look to the guidance of Remake Learning in the region um, around um, equity in um, education. And so their guidance talks about um, focusing on um, learners with specific identities or a combination of identities, and that includes learners in poverty, learners of color, female identified learners, learners in rural areas, and learners with disabilities. So our education partnerships strive to um, work with learners who might not have um, that access um, to, um, to great environmental education. Uh, and so these pictures are just a couple of our partners, Pema Tuning Lab, um, Ecology. Um, this is them at our Cats Natural Area in Crawford County that I mentioned before. And they work with a lot of rural learners and getting them um, to these resources. And then on the right is uh, our heritage staff with the Pittsburgh uh, 
Pittsburgh, uh, oh gosh, um, <laughs> Pittsburgh Parks Conservancy, um, and uh, with their Young Naturalist Program. Um, and that program really works with young people from the city of Pittsburgh or the area of Pittsburgh um, that are historically underrepresented in the conservation field. So those are two of our, our sustained partnerships. And then because we are working with existing education programs, um, we're not offering standalone programs or offering curricula. Um, so we do focus though on these kind of key educational themes. Um, and I'll just kind of go through a couple of examples of those themes here uh, with some of our partners. So the first is awareness. And so this is not this idea that um, kids are kind of these like empty glasses that we're filling, um, that they already are connected to nature. They're already curious and wonder. Um, and so we're fostering a connection that already exists. It's very community-based. So again, there's nature all around. So how do we get them to, uh, or support them being connected to the nature that's all around them? So it's community-based. Um, it looks to foster this affinity or this connection that we are a part of nature. Uh, these are some elementary school students at the University of uh, Universal Academy of Pittsburgh in Swissvale. Um, we did uh, tree planting around their school campus. And so they helped with the tree planting. And we also took some time to just get curious about the different kinds of trees and what those different uh, kinds of trees look like up close. So they were, they were really great that day. Um, it's also about this um, educational concept as well of like catching attention. So student driven, learner driven, what are they interested in? But then how do you hold that attention as well, building up a sense of um, I can learn about the things that I'm curious about. So how do we provide tools and resources? So this is a partnership with the Allegheny County Library Association um, as well as well as Allegheny Land Trust and Allegheny County Park Rangers um, help to curate these nature backpacks that are available um, through the Allegheny County Public Libraries. There are similar programs in other counties throughout the region, throughout the country. Um, and so again, this idea of how do we give them the tools and the materials um, to explore the nature all around them. Um, and then it's also about how do we foster these personal connections? Um, so personal exploration, um, different forms of expression. This is a, a participant in the Operation Better Blocks Junior, Gre Junior Green Corps. Uh, it's based out of Homewood. And we've been working with this organization for a while. Our staff has um, worked alongside them in uh, tree care um, projects in Homewood and worked to help build their skills for career focused um, experiences. Um, but we brought them out to Tom's Run Nature Reserve in Allegheny County this year and gave them a chance to just kind of, again, be in nature um, and experience it. And I think that that's, um, that unstructured time is really important as well. Um, knowledge. Um, knowledge isn't everything, but it is important. Um, so, you know, this is our watershed staff in a classroom. And I think sometimes it's important to be in a classroom. That's where kids very often are learning. And so kind of meeting them where they're at, um, connecting to the, the educators' um, goals and what they're teaching but then also building those relationships with the students when we bring them outside. Um, and I think this is a real strength that we bring to um, conservation education in the region is our staff is, is just, um, just experts in these field studies and these protocols calls that teachers may not feel as confident with. And so how do these students get a chance to explore some of those, um, those real world um, examples of these concepts in their backyards? Um, so this is a, um, a great example of that as well. And it helps, I think, build a knowledge of environmental careers as well. So many of our staff say like, I didn't even know this was a job <laughs> when I was in school, right? So how do they get exposed to different things that people do for a living and how that might broaden kind of their understanding. And then another part of knowledge, again, because we're coming alongside educators, we wanna help extend the learning that they're already prioritizing and connect it to outside learning and connect it to these real world experiences. Um, so for example, um, we've worked with, um, as I mentioned, our school ground greening work, we work with Pittsburgh Public Schools Early Childhood 
And we've worked with a lot of those teachers over the past couple of years to just make those really explicit connections to their curricula. So we worked with some teachers to develop outdoor activities that match up their kind of standards and their units um, so that they have things all year round to be able to bring the children out for and also providing them with some supplies um, that they can bring outside. Um, so we've worked with them with that for a few years. And these are some students from uh, Beechwood Early Childhood Green Space. Um, and we did some uh, literacy activities and um, some social emotional learning about how to be kind to the small things that live in their green space. All right. And then looking at um, skills. So we already talked about kind of these field studies. Um, so getting a chance to do this hands-on work, hands -on work um, and connecting it to these larger conservation concepts. So understanding how to do a stream study and how that can help us understand water quality. Um, and these, again, these are some students learning with their teacher, right? So this like learning alongside um, and how do we all um, make these connections. Um, and this is our uh, community forestry staff with some incoming freshmen at Point Park University. These freshmen were focusing on um, their campus and greening their campus for the school year. And so with our community forestry staff were able to go out with them and do a simulation of like, how do we do a tree inventory? How do we use technology um, to capture information about individual trees and help us understand um, the health of the trees and the biodiversity of the trees um, and the canopy and opportunities um, for tree care um, or new trees. And so that was a really great opportunity there. And then we have a lot of groups that we work with that are are building their skills, whether it's, um, you know, learning how to um, plant trees, plant, you know, gardens, take care of gardens. Um, this organization, Student Conservation Association, these young people spend the entire summer um, learning all of these wonderful um, work-based skills of how to work outside, how to work in conservation and um, one of the big things they do in Pittsburgh is pull invasive species. And um, sometimes they don't always necessarily know why or get a chance to really explore the bigger picture. So here, one of our um, Gardens and Green Space staff is giving them a tour of a riparian area where we've done a tree planting and a rain garden right outside the Carnegie Science Center. And it's giving these students a chance to understand like how do we manage um, these urban green spaces? Why, how do we choose different species? Um, how do we manage the invasive species and how is it part of a bigger picture that contributes to the health of our watershed, um, prevent, you know, deals with storm water runoff, all of these pieces. So really helping these young people who are building these skills, these job ready skills to join um, the environmental uh, field, um, these bigger chances to, to connect to these bigger picture conservation issues. And I just wanted to point out that this is during COVID um, and you can see the students are keeping a good distance and just again the opportunity to be outside and learn outside I think is a real asset um, to this work. And then lastly, um, or not lastly, almost lastly, attitudes. So how do we inspire these commitments to conservation? Um, this is a group called Investing Now. It's a group of high school students who are already identified themselves as interested in STEAM professions. Um, so they're exploring those professions. And, um, but conservation sometimes doesn't always pop up uh, in STEAM. Um, and so giving them an opportunity to learn how to um, use uh, STEAM to address kind of land use issues. Our, our heritage staff did a simulation with them on kind of land use and deciding about how we use land and what consideration for our natural heritage should be there. Um, and they got a chance to do all that and kind of look a little bit more closely at what those factors are. And so some of the feedback from the participants were, you know, I'm gonna pay better attention to how my decisions can impact the environment and I'm gonna be more observant and make positive changes. So this idea of identifying as a conservationist or identifying these behaviors as something you wanna do is, a, is, is one of the goals. Um, also, just how do we inspire um, and help young people connect to careers in conservation? So this is Stream Girls. This is a program that our watershed staff participate in um, with a team from Chapman State Park, Trout Unlimited Girl Scouts, and it's focused on female-identified learners and 
professionals. And so these uh, young people can come together with these professionals for the day and they do um, not only kind of, um, kind of protocols and field studies, they do kind of visual habitat assessments, which is something our staff does all the time, but they also do recreational activities art reflection. Um, so really looking at them as holistic learners and encouraging them and letting them come alongside these professionals. And then um, again, just how are we creating a community of conservationists? Um, and so this is a, a, a picture from a program with the Pittsburgh Parks Conservancy who I mentioned earlier. Um, and I just wanted to share a quote from one of the participants about their experience. So they said, I've been wild about moths forever and I finally got to meet someone who didn't just share my fascination but who had become an expert and made a career out of his passion. Uh, Pete Woods, one of our natural heritage staff members was approachable, extremely knowledgeable. We bombarded him with questions which he eagerly answered. I had only met him on the first evening and a few hours later we were crouching on the ground underneath lights and inspecting a particularly interesting specimen. So this idea that these young people who are really passionate and interested can come along folks who are also really excited about these things um, and share that time and uh, share that wonder, um, I think is a really magical experience. And um, the Young Naturalist program is something that we've been invited into for years and are really grateful to get to work with those great learners. And then lastly, action, right? So again, how do we put this into local action? How do we reinforce this? Um, this is a program that's been sustained for a while um, with the Crawford County Conservation District, DCNR. Um, our, our folks have worked with them as well and bringing students out from those local high schools to do these riparian plantings each year. Um, so this is really built into the fabric of the way that they contribute to their community. And then um, this is a uh, part of our Trees for New Kensington project. So we have some high school students here. They came out with their principal to plant trees um, in their community. And sometimes um, we start with action, right? So these awareness and skills and knowledge it isn't a linear process, right? And so sometimes we start in a place of action of coming out and volunteering and planting a tree. Um, and, and kind of how does this act of planting a tree help create this sense of connection and care. Like, I'm quite sure that these kids, when they drive by um, that tree are going to have a different relationship with that tree than other trees. Um, and so how can that be a place of, of kicking off um, this process? Um, and I, the other thing I'll add is that, um, you know, our staff do this work all the time. They plant trees all the time. And so when they get a chance to work with young people, I think it really reinvigorates the sense of us all being in it together and kind of generationally, how are we coming together to, um, to do this work. So lastly, I just wanted to kind of run through um, one example of uh, an education partner we've had. And again, how this is not necessarily a linear pathway through these different pieces, but it all kind of folds into itself. So we were connected with Cornell High School on their Ohio River Heritage Project, which was kind of a multidisciplinary project, but part of it was putting in a green space at their school, and it was very student driven, and our staff came in um, to act as advisors and consultants and help make them connections um, to um, providers and where to get trees from and things like that. Um, and so this is uh, them putting in the garden that they designed. And we also brought them on field trips to greenhouses to help them understand plant selection and why certain plants over other plants. We did classroom visits. Um, so kind of again, building their knowledge around the garden they were building and how to do that with biodiversity in mind and native plants and pollinator plants. This is also a project where the students really took the lead. So this is two of the students at a Remake Learning STEAM showcase where they were talking about the project, where they were talking to the people in the room about their plans on this garden. And so how do we really, again, treat them as the conservationists that they are today um, and not some future thing that they're going to be. Uh, and then also just extending that learning. So they have woods around their campus and a trail. So our natural heritage staff started taking the ecology class out to do some tree ID and to think about trail stewardship and just think about how the woods around their campus connects to the green space and, and how to kind of um, think about those things in kind of a systems perspective. 
And then lastly, we've taken them on some field trips to Tom's Run Nature Reserve, which is right across um, a highway from their school, but they had never been. And I think one of the things that was really amazing from this is that, um, you know, Tom's Run Nature Reserve is a place where we've done a lot of restoration work and our, our, our land staff was able to speak to that and our heritage staff as well. And I think for them to see a place that had been restored, one of the comments from the students was that it really gave them hope in nature's ability to heal um, and restore with these efforts and made them even more committed to the work they were doing on their campus. So I think, again, seeing how these experiences can fold into themselves is really great. So just lastly, with just a word about how to share your love of nature with youth. So there's a couple of suggestions here. Um, I also included a link to our website where we've worked with our staff to recommend some children's books, um, books that really help celebrate the local nature that they can see all around us. No offense to dinosaurs and sharks, they're wonderful, um, but really how to also just build connections with things that kids might see um, out and about in the region. So thanks so much and I'll hand it back to James. Thanks so much, Danielle. Uh, before we move on to Ashley, I just want to take a moment to remind everybody that we uh, will have a little time for questions at the end of the presentation. So uh, please feel free to go ahead and submit those as we move along here uh, using the Q&A function on your Zoom menu. Ashley? OK. Thank you, James. Um, let me just share my screen here. Okay, um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about education programs at Falling Water, but first some background information about Falling Water. Um, Falling Water is um, it's, it's a house designed by Frank Lloyd Wright, um, designed and constructed between 1936 and 1939. And it was designed as a vacation home for the Kaufman family of Pittsburgh. It's considered to be the very best example of Frank Lloyd Wright's philosophy of organic architecture. Um, and in 1963, Edgar Kaufman Jr. made the decision to entrust Falling Water and the surrounding landscape to the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy so that both the building and the grounds would be cared for. Um, and today, of course, we are tasked with presenting it as a museum and our goal is to um, make it available to everyone as a source of inspiration and a springboard for learning. Um, at Falling Water, I'm really fortunate to work with a team of very talented um, and thoughtful educators, and we are often discussing um, the this big question, this big idea of how do you facilitate inspiration? Um, it's not something that can just be handed to someone. It's something that happens for each individual, and it happens differently for everyone. Um, and so we've come up with some ways, uh, some strategies within our programming to attempt to facilitate inspiration and of course the way that we've developed the programs themselves. Um, they're very visitor centered and visitor directed. Um, we are interested in everyone's individual lines of inquiry um, and we try to create moments and opportunities for discovery. We also challenge our visitors to be fully present while they're on our site. And so we lean into this um, no technology or low technology method of learning across all of our programs. And of course, our goal is to allow our visitors to make meaning for themselves and we follow and support their individual lines of inquiry while they're with us. And one of the ways that we do this is during public tours. Um, this is Falling Water's largest and longest running education program. Um, so we try not to assume that um, what, will, what will be interesting uh, about Falling Water for each individual. Um, and because of that, we have shifted our methodology during tours to a more um, open-ended discovery-based format. So it's a conversational 
um, tour with exploratory moments. And all the while, our educators are paying attention to each visitor's interests. And um, therefore, each tour experience is customized and each tour is different. So we hope you will visit us more than once. Um, and, you know, most of our tours are one hour long. Um, we're offering them six days a week, every day but Wednesday. And um, we're open all six days a week through the end of November. In December, we are open for tours on weekends only. And then we're closed for guided tours in January and February. But visitors are welcome to come to our site for a winter walk and explore the exterior. We also have um, a range of field trip experiences that we offer. And we specifically are interested in working with local school groups, um, schools that are located within, let's say a 30 to 60 mile radius of falling water. And um, we have a program called Right in Our Backyard, and it is funded through Falling Waters Lodging Partners in Education. And you can find out who those lodging partners are on our website. Um, and the lodging partners, their donations go to funding transportation, ticket costs, sometimes purchasing a lunch for the school students for their visit to Falling Water. And our goal for the Right in Our Backyard program is that all of our local neighboring school students will get to visit Falling Water at least once during their K through 12 um, school career. During the pandemic, we developed a new way for um, K through 12 students and even younger uh, children to learn about Falling Water um, during a program called Family Field Trips. These are private tours for family groups, and uh, it's a great way for us to include our youngest visitors in learning and experiencing falling water. Something else that evolved out of necessity during the pandemic are virtual field trips. So our school programs team um, has connected with schools all over the country um, through these virtual field trips. So it is something that we are planning to continue um, in a post-pandemic world because it's really expanded falling water and helped us to connect with students that we would never have connected with. We also um, do outreach programs. We visit local libraries and um, do programs for children and their parents together. Um, this is an image of uh, this year's education intern, Zoe Kleeman, leading a workshop at a local library, um, which started with reading a children's book, and then it turned into a hands-on building activity um, in the Connellsville Library. That's where this picture was taken. So in addition to those educational programs um, for local and national K through 12 students, um, we also have a branch of programming that we call Falling Water Institute, which is immersive programs um, for, uh, this one is called high school residency. So it's for high school students and they come to our site, they stay for a week and it's a very um, demanding schedule. They're working in the studio and working at Falling Water on studio-based projects um, uh, for long hours from morning till night. And then on the final day, um, they have created portfolio-worthy pieces um, that they share during a group critique. So this, these images give you kind of an idea of what the residency experience is, is is like. Um, they get exceptional access to falling water outside of tour hours. And um, they're able to do things like sit on the floor and sketch for an extended period of time. So they're making um, level of observation beyond that of the average tour participant. And then they are also able to work in our state-of-the-art 
studio, the Chatean studio at High Meadow. And this is a picture of the group working in the studio during a high school residency. Um, and because we have so much time with them, the learning is very in-depth. The, um, the projects are very highly resolved. They're able to iterate upon their ideas throughout the course of the week, and they benefit, of course, from working alongside one another um, and that studio culture that develops over the course of the week. It's a really special kind of bond, I think, that develops. Um, we also have similar programs, residencies for college groups, and we have programs for adult professionals. These images are graduate students from Chatham University who spent a week um, doing a college residency. And over the course of the week, they just designed chairs inspired by falling water and I don't know if you can tell from these pictures, but they were challenged to use just one piece of plywood um, and some zip ties to hold their chairs together. And they all look pretty pleased that their plywood chairs are holding their weight in the photo. Nobody crashed to the ground. Um, so mission accomplished. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about one specific program um, that has become more and more popular over the years. Uh, Gnome House Design Challenge is what it's called. It is a distance learning curriculum that is a series of seven lessons um, that students receive by mail and they complete either on their own or it could be facilitated by a classroom teacher. Um, and here are the, the steps we follow the real architectural design process, just like a real architect. Students receive a client in the mail. So this is a picture of one of our architects receiving his client in the mail. Um, each client is unique. They have their own um, biography that tells about the client's needs, what their family's like, what their design aesthetic preferences are, um, any access needs, all of these become considerations for this multi-step design process. Um, so in the first lesson, the students do an interview and they get to know um, the client. Um, oh, and this, this image I just included to make sure that I mentioned that this became a really effective curriculum for learning about falling water during the pandemic, um, as you can imagine. So during that interview process, students are provided with some, as I mentioned, background information. They also get to see their client's current living situation. And we do actually have, I think, 35 different gnome uh, biographies that we've developed. So the students need to carefully look at these images and consider what can be improved about their current living situation. Um, during the interview process, students are challenged to draw their, their gnomes, um, their families, their favorite um, hobbies. They interview their gnome to get this information from them. So a little bit of a make-believe, um, but the images and the sketches that we receive back are always really very fun. Um, they also do a precedent study they dive into the history of falling water and its design. If they are students who live locally, they can come to falling water for a field trip to explore it themselves in person. And if not, they're able to take a virtual field trip um, with our school programs team. After they've done that information gathering step and they've done their precedent study, then they are ready to take all of these sources of inspiration and combine them into a design for a, a home that is customized to their clients' needs and interests and specifications. Um, and here is an image of one of our local neighboring schools doing the Gnome House Design Project. Um, as I mentioned, it works just as well for independent students and for classrooms. And this is the outcome. Some of the outcomes are um, models. Um, they are, our models are full size scale. They're not scaled um, because our clients are only 
an inch and a half tall. So the models are full, full size. Um, and they use typically um, recycled materials, post-consumer cardboard, whatever they have around their house, they can use to do this project. It's designed in such a way that it can be done, it can be completed for zero dollars without purchasing any supplies. Some students, if they have Legos, they use Legos. Some students, if they have Minecraft, they'll make their model digitally in Minecraft. Um, and then at the end of the cycle, which um, the project culminates in May with the Gnome House Design Symposium, which is at Falling Water, where students bring their models, their drawings, their gnome clients with them. They present science fair style and their clients get to take a gnome eye view tour of Falling Water. Um, and a fun fact is that the gnomes actually have special permissions and access that most humans do not. Um, and here's a close up of a model from this past year's um, Gnome House Design Symposium. This model was inspired by both Falling Water and the Guggenheim. And um, it just goes to show that, you know, students can dive in and they can get become more interested and start researching beyond just Falling Water. Um, hopefully, it's just the start of their interest in architecture and design. Um, so this is a GIS map that shows where the locations of gnome houses that have been designed. We actually have some more data points to enter that would show you that the gnomes are slowly taking over the world um, and that we have gnome house architects um, all over, all over country and starting to branch out internationally. Um, if you'd like to learn more about any of the education programs that I mentioned or about the Gnome House Design Challenge, maybe you know a gnome architect who might be interested, uh, please visit our website, www.fallingwater.org. And now I'll hand it back to James. So uh, thank you, Ashley, that was great. Um, before we move on here, I wanna give everybody a chance to submit some more questions. Um, while we do that, I wanna let you all know that there are a lot of great ways for you to get involved at WPC. One of the best ways for you to get your feet wet and sometimes literally get your feet wet is by becoming a volunteer. Uh, we have regular need for volunteers at community garden plannings, uh, land stewardship events, uh, tree plantings, um, and you can do things like um, help build and maintain trails and take care of WPC preserves. Uh, if you'd like to take the next step, though, we encourage you to become a member. So um, we can't do the work that we do without members like you. Uh, they, you make all of our great conservation work possible. If you'd like to learn more about this, you can go to waterlandlife.org slash donate. And we have a lot of great information about uh, what you can do to become a member and uh, the benefits that come along with that. So let's go ahead and get back to questions. So we have a few here. Uh, one more of a comment and a question. Uh, say they love how education work is so much related to place here. I don't know if either one of you want to address that. Sure, yeah. I think um, at Falling Water, it, you know, it, we're working at, with such a prime example of site specificity and what's possible when um, an architect is deriving inspiration directly from a place. And so it just seems so obvious to us that our programs should follow suit and be site specific. Absolutely. And I think um, I probably said most of what I would need to say in the presentation, but just to reinforce this idea that um, we want to start from a place of, of feeling an affinity towards the natural world. And um, we don't want it to be something that is 
far away um, and something that we can interact with and do interact with every day. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things, especially with younger children, and I, you know, made the joke about dinosaurs, um, but again, this idea that, you know, sometimes our, our stories about the natural world um, are about things that are far away and we have such compelling um, natural treasures here. And so how are we really um, grounding it in both the learner's lived experience of what their life is like every single day and when do they come across nature um, and using that as a starting place to learn and appreciate all of it. Great. Um, another question, is the way young people learn different as a result of technologies that have developed in recent years? And if so, what are the most profound implications? Um, I, I can think of an example of this. Do you mind, Danielle? Okay. Um, so over time, our observation was, especially over the last um, five years or so, that um, our high school residency participants, for example, were have been more and more attached to their devices and a little less um, tuned in to each other um, in real life. And so um, we we had a year where, you know, we had we everybody sat down to dinner and, the students were completely silent, but they occasionally would laugh at the same time. And we realized that they were all texting each other instead of talking over dinner. Um, and so we started to realize, you know, a part of our goal is for people to have the sensation of being fully immersed in nature. Um, and so we've started to respectfully ask that the students limit their technology use so that they can be more fully present and it's not you know an attempt to be cruel to them or to make them uncomfortable but more so just this recognition that opportunities to be fully present and offline are becoming few and far between and so it's a unique thing that we're able to offer um, during our programs I think um we're also in the studio, we're not relying on digital drawing at all. We prompt them to draw with their hands and use paper and pencil and rulers. And a lot of the comments from the students, I mean, almost all of them will say that they've never drawn with a uh, paper and pencil before um, high school students. So we're getting to a point, I think, where the even the simple connection between like your hand and this tangible paper and pencil is starting to become sort of a, a rare, um, a rare type form of learning. Um, so we feel we feel good about um, being able to offer this kind of experience for high schoolers and the their reaction to being relatively offline for the week. It has been so positive. A lot of them have commented, um, their feedback has been that they have felt so um, so little stress during the week or that they weren't stressed out because of their phone. And it's it's nice to hear. Um, we're, we don't try to do a complete and total digital detox by any means, but it seems to us that there is a lot of value in um, just that, um, I, that concept of being fully present um, together. That was a long answer. Sorry, Danielle. No, I loved it. It was great. And I think, you know, to just confirm on our end some of that, you know, I think we shared um, the idea of that building this kind of personal connection and, and how can we foster that in a way that isn't moderated by technology or a device or an app. And so um, one of the things we try to do when we bring um, learners out is we provide journals and pencils and encourage them to draw and write and whatever it is that they um, feel compelled to do, uh, jot down questions that are coming up. So I think 
being able to do that. And we did, we have gotten some great feedback. I know that Cornell High School students, um, one of them made the comment that, you know, it's just so rare to get time like this in their kind of busy schedules. Um, so I really do think that that kind of being in nature is so foundational and, and we really try to build that in whenever um, it can meet those students where they're at. I think um, we kind of do a both and, right? And so um, some of what we're trying to do is also teach kind of like skills and um, career ready kind of tools and techniques, which sometimes include technology. So using things like Seek um, and AppSeek or iNaturalist, which are um, community science um, opportunities to identify species and um, log species and, and participate in the gathering of information about that. Um, we've done that. And we also are currently, you know, I'm not an expert in technology education. And we're lucky that we have some folks in uh, the region who are. And so we're actually working with a project right now with this idea of how can we use technology to maybe show the things that are hard to see? Um, so we're working right now with the um, Carnegie Mellon University's Entertainment Technology Center and some of the students are developing um, a game to show how rain gardens work, right? So it's not a good idea to be outside when there's a really heavy rainstorm. And you also really can't see the way that rain gardens work and what happens under the ground. And so how can technology kind of deepen? We still wanna use imagination, right? We still wanna get kids out and say like, imagine it's raining, where would the water go? That's still a really important experience, but then to be able to actually use technology to show that and get them to gamify different plant choices and things like that, um, I think it's just kind of meeting them where they are, right? So I think we take a little bit of a both and, and and just try to work with the folks, you know, again, our model is how do we partner with and um, work with the folks who really know how to how to do some of that education technology stuff. Yeah, I agree with you, Danielle. And then um, at the same rate, if someone leaves with something that they are going to go home and Google, that is a major win. Um, we love that outcome. Yeah, so Danielle, related to the last thing you mentioned, uh, partnerships. Um, somebody asked, are your organizations looking for learning partners? If so, who and how should an organize, organization contact us? Sure, at, at least on our end with conservation education, we generally try to find um, education organizations who are around either temporal projects we're working on. So like, again, Trees for New Kensington is a project we're doing right now. So we're really focused on building our educational partnerships there and some other Westmoreland County um, projects. Um, we're always looking for educational partners who are um, close to the lands that we steward. So um, on our lands website, our, when you can see the different properties um, that we manage and steward, um, those are great places for us to help make those connections. Um, and we're always open to talking with folks um, so they can always just contact me. Um, it, it'll get forwarded to me through that info at PA Conserve. I'm always excited to hear what people are doing and see if there's ways that we can be a partner. But I think part of our model as well is connecting folks to other regional environmental educators or just educators who are working in that space. Um, so if it's not us, it might be another great group that would be a good partner for someone who has a project in mind. Yeah, and I would say same at Falling Water, we're always interested in new partnerships and discovering new ways that Falling Water can support whatever you're doing in your classroom or at home or at organizations. Um, so yes, please reach out. Yeah, and we have one more question and a few minutes left to answer here. So uh, Ashley, uh, Someone is really impressed at how far flung the places are where students for the Gnome House Challenge come from. Um, maybe you could share with us how you reach out to those people. You know, I we have been just as surprised by that <laughs> um, as you might be uh, the map, the points on the map. So I think that people are finding out about it primarily through our social media, which has been great. Um, but it might also be that the gnomes that live in their region are asking them to get involved. That was a joke. It's hard to make a joke on Zoom because you can't hear anyone laughing, but hopefully you laughed. I'm laughing. <laughs> right, great. I think that uh, takes care of all the questions. 
So I'll just conclude by thanking everybody for attending today. Thank you to uh, Ashley and Danielle for your uh, great discussion and I think some really good question and answer uh, at the end here. So uh, please remember, you can always find out more about Western Pennsylvania Conservancy by visiting our website at waterlandlife.org. Um, you can also find us in a variety of places on social media um, by following our social media handles. Um, it's Waterlands Life on uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and uh, we're also available on LinkedIn at Western-Pennsylvania-Conservancy.